Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 429. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's August 15th, 2018. All right, it's another two-episode Wednesday. Sometimes we do this on Friday, but I just recorded with Gavin. I got that posted. You should watch it. It's a good episode. I'm now going to do an episode with George. Uh, we covered Gavin's health real quick. He's feeling fine. I got a boo-boo. I cut my finger. Um, George, are you over your sickness? No. No? No, I'm dying, Kevin. I'm going to start filling out forms for Social Security or uh, <laughs> call the pension fund, see if I can get a disability. <laughs> No, I'm sick as a dog. Huh. Um, I first time that well, first time that I can remember this past Sunday at just before the one thirty service, I had to turn to the uh, person assisting me and say, "You take it from here. I can't do it." Um, and I went and sat in my office and I stared out the window and watched the squirrels. I was fine for five o'clock uh, at the mission congregate and the mission plant we have across town. Mm -hmm. But man, you know, after two services and a class, I just couldn't go out for the third stage, for the third act. George, I think you're just getting old. I'm getting old. That's what the doctor said. Oh, okay. I think he's, he well, tells me you have to lose weight. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, doctor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that, that, that is a striking observation on your part. You really needed to go to school for 12 years to tell me that. Uh, but he says, no, you know, in your 50s, and you takes time to heal and recover from these it things. Does. No, it does. Yeah. Which that's is not fair. I, that's not what I'm paying for. <laughs> no, you know, I want, I want. Well, I mean, they they have stuff to make you heal a little faster, but nothing makes you recover faster. And uh, you, you're tired. I I know. I'm I'm old too. And uh, no, Kevin. I mean, I'm starting to get. I I was invited to join AARP. I got this. I have been given all these coupons for Depends and for. Uh, things for erectile dysfunction. What do people know about me yeah, that right. I need to get these things in the mail? <laughs> They're on to you. <laughs> They're on to me. All right. So I'm glad we got our laughter out of out of the way in, to begin with because we we're talking about some really tough topics. Uh, the news broke yesterday that the uh, Roman Catholic Church is having um, more problems, especially in the Diocese of uh, Pennsylvania, where some 300 clergy over a period of time have molested or raped 1,000 children. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a grand jury report of an investigation they've done over the last two years. And um, to me, as a you know, little C Catholic, uh, big church guy, this hurts. Um, this is very painful to hear about the church. And I'm not the one who's going to sit here and point fingers saying, ah, it's just the Roman Catholics. They're full of pedophiles. They're full of uh, people who don't get married. And this is their own true problem because I've been involved enough in Episcopal politics, in Methodist politics, in uh, PCU uh, politics, uh, Lutheran politics, to know, and Orthodox politics, to know that this is a big problem in the whole church. Um, a lot of people study this, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about a port, uh, report that uh, uh, we know about from uh, Richard Seitz. Uh, George, you, well, first, George, what do we know about the report? The grand jury report or Richard Seitz? Uh, let's one start with the about? grand jury report, just for sure we've got our bases covered. Uh, grand jury spent 18 months in Pennsylvania looking at eight dioceses, essentially everybody but Philadelphia Archdiocese, Pittsburgh up to Erie, over to Scranton, down to Lancaster, New York, and Harrisburg, everywhere but the southeast. Mm -hmm. And they found since the war, Second World War, there have been documented uh, over a thousand cases of abuse that the church has been able to report, investigate, and over 300 priest abusers. These are things that they know about and could document. <clears throat> so we don't. So this is the minimum. And what they found is that there were some pre, some bishops who did an excellent job in combating this, but the majority of the bishops, the majority, the culture of the Catholic Church in Pennsylvania was cover up and denial. One of the things the current Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, Arch Cardinal Whirl, was an arch was a bishop of Harrisburg. Uh, during the time then when these uh, abuses took place and what was his uh, response well it was see, see no evil hear no evil take no action yeah now <clears throat> I you know 
spent a great deal of my life in Pennsylvania, and I attended at went to a Catholic university at night for two years before I went to Yale. I went, studied with the Augustinian fathers at Villanova. At no time was I aware of any problems. I mean, the August Villanova, they were great people. I, the Catholic priests I have known in my studies have all been excellent, wonderful men. But I'm very well aware of the culture of Pennsylvania Catholicism, which is us against them. Uh, especially in the Philadelphia area, we keep our secrets because if people find out that Father so and is a pervert, then we'll get hammered by the Protestants across the street. And so this culture of secrecy, the culture of closing one's eyes, of, of looking away, of making the institution more important than the people you're serving, comes as no surprise. What is horrific is the choice made by many bishops and church leaders to basically ignore this and reshuffle people. And this is bad, Kevin. This is really bad. But again, as you say, we have instances uh, in the Episcopal Church like this that I am aware of. Yeah. Well, um, before we go there, let's talk a little bit about uh, Richard Scythe. He's recently died. Uh, people probably read his obituary in the New York Times. And uh, he studied this. Uh, he was a priest and, and went on to get married and left the priesthood uh, back in the 70s. And he spent his lifetime looking into how this occurred. And he, he put together some statistics that are rather surprising. Richard Seip was a Roman Catholic priest who left the priesthood in 1970. He just died at 85. And he was a psychotherapist and psychologist, and he specialized in clergy abuse. Mm -hmm. He was not one of these nut job campaigners out to take the Catholic Church for money. He was somebody who was looking to reform the church and make it right and do God's work. He was always a believer. He wasn't one of these people who left and therefore hated the church. Seip worked as a professional psychologist working with abuser clergy. And he published a number of academic studies, and he estimated that at any one time, half the Catholic clergy are being unfaithful to their vows of celibacy. At any one time. Right. About 25% are engaged in active homosexual of relationships. So those who are uh, unfaithful to their vows of celibacy, half will be f fiddling with women, half will be fiddling with men. And 6% at any one time will be fiddling with young boys. And this 6% is where they're drawing the 300 priests who've abused at a minimum over 1,000 children. Yeah, because uh, <clears throat> in the whole, uh, under this study and uh, um, testament that was given, there were 15,000 priests over the whole study. And so it, we're, we're not t saying 300 out of 300. We're talking 300 to 15,000. And, and, that, and that purgates this uh, statistic. And what is so appalling is that the lives and the ministry, the work of the 14,700 who were not perverts mm -hmm. is tainted by the actions of the 300. And what makes it so bad is that the Catholic hierarchy looked the other way. This is the issue with Cardinal McCarrick. This is what is now being accused of Cardinal Whirl. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the problem. It's the problem of this is what happened in Chile, where the Pope had to send a special investigator. This is what happened. They're having a testimony up in England about uh, an exclusive Catholic boys' boarding school. Um, uh, I forget the name of it. It's just escaped from my head. It's a Benedictine Abbey, sure. where the Catholic Church knew, its leaders knew, but chose to do nothing or to hide it. And it was the rare priest um, in Pennsylvania, what was so disheartening to read was that in some cases the culture of some areas of the church had been so captured by a clique that normal healthy people, men, young men studying for the priesthood were pushed out. Yeah, that's right. Because they were not like the majority culture in that particular institution. Now, well, yeah. what is this saying or doing to the men and women, the religious uh, the priests who have given their lives to God and to the church to have it essentially all wiped away by criminally incompetent bishops. Now let's just talk about how this applies to every denomination. Uh, you certainly have experience within the Episcopal Church, uh, especially uh, with Benison and others, about cover-up, uh, about uh, basically taking the accuser and ruining their lives. Yes. 
Uh, there was a very famous case in the Diocese of Central New York where a priest called his bishop to say, I've just discovered my predecessor was molesting young boys, and he referred this to the bishop. And the bishop turned around and started attacking him for making waves and problems. And this man eventually was brought on trial by the bishop, and the man won. The bishop lost. And was bishop was shown to be an absolute horrible... Well, I'll pause there, because... Uh, <laughs> the bishop was it. found to be uh, <clears throat> not... Not a, not a Christian. <laughs> well, and who was this again? Uh, it's actually the uh, bishop of the Episcopal Church in South Carolina. After his retirement, he wound up. One of the wonderful things oh, about South not, Carolina... Not the, Mar the, not the Mark Lawrence uh, faction. Not the Mark the, Lawrence. The other, yeah. the other faction. Yeah. One, of the, one, of, one of the reasons why South Carolina is such an intractable mess is that the Episcopal Church has appointed the, probably two of the worst bishops of the current generation uh, to lead them. So any idea of reconciliation or hope, when you've got, uh, well, let's just talk about the current one. This is a man, it's so hard for a bishop to lose a case against one of his clergy for misconduct. Yet he did. This man is guilty of cover-up. And does the Episcopal Church give a damn? No! He's given a little plum job in his retirement so we can destroy another part of the church. I remember visiting a seminary uh and I was talking to, uh, he wasn't dean then, but he was, he's the dean now. And he says, you know, I went to school in the 70s and, and late 60s and 70s. And basically everybody I went to school with was, you know, borderline gay or draft dodgers. People who didn't want to uh, join the war. Uh, in the late 80s, all these people I went to seminary with are dead. Either of AIDS, suicide, depression. Um, and other such whatnots, and I'm like, you're kidding, and he said, nope, this, it, it's the way things were, and I remember talking to a priest of mine uh, almost 15 years ago who went to Yale, and he says, if you're good and go to Yale, if you're a, a, a true believer, you're not going to come out a true believer. Um, very few. Well, there are, there are exceptions. There are exceptions, um, and he was one of them. But uh, seminary, I <laughs> you're one. Seminary, uh, uh, th there are bad seminaries in the Episcopal Church. Well, do you remember Foley Beach gave an interview with uh, David Old, uh, Arl, sure. yeah, and he talked about when he went to Swanee. Um, well, he didn't use these words, but it was well known at the time. Swanee was a haven for wife swapping. You have seminarians swapping wives, and the and the clergy leading it, and the 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 dean of it who later went on to infamy for his role in uh, many other things, yes. Greg Anderson. Sure. Uh, we, won't get, we won't slander him on this program. We'll wait for another show. The culture of Swanee when Foley Beach was there, and, and he said in his interview, was horrid. Yeah. And I know when I went to Yale Divinity School, there was a great group, a small group of people, faithful men and women, but then there were these other people who it really was cheaper for them to go to seminary than to get psychotherapy or to be committed to a mental institution. And the, I mean, when I went through the Diocese of Pennsylvania, part of the uh, process was difficult for me, and it took me a long time to pass through it because uh, they were not, as I was told, they're not looking for white, masculine men. That's the past. They need a more feminized male aspirants. And my problem was I wasn't, I didn't fit the bill. Um, and that we're now paying for that problem in some places, in the in most places of the Episcopal Church, we're paying for that in the Catholic Church. I had a, uh, a man I studied with, uh, he went to uh, general theology, he, he went through the Catholic ordination process, but he came out of a diocese and he told his bishop he was, he told the dean he was gay, but he was going to be celibate. Well, he was said, you really should think about becoming a Jesuit or an Episcopalian. <laughs> And so, where did he do? He went on to General Seminary to become an Episcopalian. Now, I really don't want us to be the dumping ground for people who should be Jesuits or Episcopalians for the Catholic Church, the good part of it. But that's what we've become. Yeah. Now, we also find, you know, it's not just liturgical churches, Willow Creek, and uh, I forget the name of the, the priest, uh, you know, nice famous. Hybels, Dan Hybels. Yep. H uh, y b e l s. Yep. Nice uh, famous priest. 
uh, built up a church over many years and uh, uh, this whole time has been uh, unfaithful. And uh, you finally caught up to him and uh, now Willow Creek is just collapsing left and right. Uh, everybody's resigning and the people can't wait to get out. Um, this is not well, just a liturgical problem. Well, you know, Kevin, I really do need to apologize to Jimmy Swaggart. He was just a trailblazer. He was a trailblazer. Oh, he was a trailblazer. <laughs> you know, he was one of the first mega church pastors. He, he and Jim and Tammy Faker, they all went oh. through meltdowns 20 years ago. Little did we know. No, little did we that know. The, the, uh, the Mark Bells and the, and the Hybels and these people would have their own Andy Stanley rector a pa pastor of the largest baptist church now in atlanta the atlanta area basically has become a marcionite saying right. no uh, no old new testament don't belong together to hitch ourselves from the old testament <laughs> you know <sighs> i i jimmy i'm sorry man i i just was unkind and unfair to you i remember that i mean in 82 83 that is when i first came to faith you know that was all the news jim and tammy baker uh uh Jimmy Swagger and uh, all that, you know, like I knew I was getting into a mess when I joined the church back then. But part of it, these all, this is all interrelated, all intertwined. Mm -hmm. The Catholic abuse scandal, the collapse of the Episcopal Church, the moral collapse of the Hybels and the Swaggers and all that. It comes from the fact that people are willing to excuse the doctrinal and theological error because they want short-term gain. Mm -hmm. Heibel's charismatic man who created from nothing a massive megachurch. Okay, he's a sexual serial philanderer, allegedly. Well, there, there. Alan won't have to edit this for us, our oh, lawyers. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but people knew, I'm sure, I assume people knew about this, but it's better to keep the project going. That's right. Because we've got this great guy. It's better to keep the ranks of our clergy filled, even though we're getting substandard people, because they're on our side, they're on our team. I mean, who cares if you don't believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection? Um, you're the right sort of person for us at this time in the life of the church. Well, we're and when gonna, that happens, we're not going to now pay for that. I don't want to name names here, so don't name the name. But we were just talking in the pre-show about a famous uh, New Testament professor or Old Testament, which wasn't, uh, who, because he's conservative, people just look the other way to his married life. I, I, look, let's just move on, move on, move on. <laughs> on well, this is a perfect example. This yeah. is a perfect example. Yeah. Those who know him sort of say, okay, oh, and is this your wife? <laughs> and we don't ask and what happened to the last one? That's right, last week. And the one before that. Because uh, his work advances the cause. Because his work is not trinally and theologically solid, but his personal life is a fiasco. Yeah. Um, um, well, I mean, we've, we've done a, a, enough time here uh, on this topic. Let's ask our viewers to keep all these victims in prayer. Uh, many of these victims are still alive um, and are just dealing with, you know, just the ultimate tragedy, having someone you trust uh, ha have the ultimate betrayal of you. Um, George, we get viewer mail all the time. Sometimes viewer ma mail rises to the occasion that we get to read it on the air. And you had an interesting one about our uh, topic two weeks ago. I thought we'd read it. Last week, I, well, what well, well, we uh, have, who knows? Uh, uh, we won't use last name, but Alan from yes, England Alan. wrote, and we talked about uh, we had talked about the difference between the Scots and the English, and other viewers had written saying, if you think the Scots are pills, which you make sure you meet the people from Belfast, <laughs> the Northern right. Irish, they're <laughs> really. Yeah, we'll stop there. That's right. Before we insult that con that group of people, and he said, George, um, you and Kevin, being foreigners, don't really know this, but. It's not so much Scottish English. Yes, that's a major thing. Sure. But it's a north-south. Hmm. The southern, he said, you know, I'm from the north of England, and that's where the England's Bible Belt is. That's where you still have the residue of working-class Christians who come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and are seeking to be faithful to the Gospels and the Scriptures. And those are the Anglo-Saxons, and as you move farther south and it becomes more Norman England, mm -hmm. you get down to the south, which he basically said were all limp-wristed, uh, <laughs> rather wishy-washy people. 
But his, his point is saying that the establishment that we call the Church of England and the uh, hierarchy, its bishops and its uh, leading academics and clergy are almost exclusively from the South and represent a different culture than the North of England. And he said, we were on to something, that there are culture wars in English, England beyond uh, the ones that we're talking about. They also address uh, the distinctive cultures of North versus South in England. Yeah, and I, I have to believe that you know, he's very correct in that. You know, we find it here just you know, within the Northeast. There's North, Northeast and South Northeast, and there's a big cultural divide. Uh, people always say, well, it's the North and South of America. That is a bigger divide. But even in states, you have um, a, a vast cultural divide within states. And it certainly now, exists and, in England and in Ireland. And now, if I'm correct, Gavin, our uh, cohort, uh, compatriot, is uh, from the South, a uh, Londoner by birth. And, mm -hmm. and would he agree that he and his fellow Southerners are limp-wristed, <laughs> rather weak-willed, uh, not particularly manly men compared to the northerners uh, yeah, we'll have to bring him on we'll have to talk about issue. that but he would probably say preach it <laughs> 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 that be accurate all right uh to our uh viewers we have to sign off now but uh oh i almost forgot the most important part of our show and that is to like it now that you already watched the whole thing, you're, you're bound to share it because you like it so much. Please share our show. If you want to go to the uh, YouTube comment section and comment on episodes, some of these comments get read on the air, so it's fun to do. And you have, if you have not subscribed yet to the episode, please click the red subscribe button and you will get instant notifications every time we post a new episode. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and we accept legal service at, what is our address, Kevin? That's right, yeah. <laughs> and you've been watching episode 429 of Anglican Unscripted.